Good morning. In 1993, as part of the Vedanta Society's observance of the centenary of Swami Vivekananda's appearance at the World's Parliament of Religions in Chicago, we invited all the head swamis of the different centers in America to speak here in St. Louis, not all at once, but month by month. And in December of that year, Swami Prabhudanandaji came from the Vedanta Society of Northern California and spoke on Swami Vivekananda's legacy to humanity. Swami Prabhudananda joined the Ramakrishna order in Bangalore in the early 50s under Swami Yateshwarananda and was head of that Bangalore center in 1970 when he was transferred to the Vedanta Society of Northern California, the Bay Area. And he served there until his passing in 2014. Uh, he's a highly respected and greatly missed monk of our order. Uh, he speaks slowly, very clearly, uh, and very calmly. And you'll feel yourself becoming calmer as he speaks. Uh, his topic, Swami Vivekananda's Legacy to Humanity. Om Namah Shri Yati Rajaya Vivekananda Surai Satchit Sukha Sarupaya Swami Neta Poharine I bow down to Vivekananda who was the king among the monks and the great hero He was the embodiment of existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. We bow down to him again and again. Om Shantihi, Shantihi, Shantihi. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Friends, I am extremely happy to introduce to you Swami Prabhudhananda Ji, the head of the Vedanta Society of Northern California, San Francisco. I already officially introduced him this morning when he spoke about four questions, introductory questions of Vedanta. This evening, the Swami will speak on Swami Vivekananda's legacy to humanity. I shall not take much time to talk more about the Swami. So, Swami will speak to you on that subject which I have already announced. Thank you. In uh, religious circles, we have a long-standing custom that is whenever we begin any study or any function, the first is salutation to the Guru, Guru Vandana. I salute the teacher and then start because these teachers have removed our ignorance and then have given us the treasure, the spiritual treasures. We have inherited a lot of spiritual treasures from these great teachers. Say Guru Parampara, there's a line of teachers and we have inherited. And then only thing is, <coughs> excuse me, we have to make use of them. That is where our problem comes. Not that we don't have anything. We have a lot of spiritual treasures. Only we don't make use of them. That's all the point. 
in every area we have got tremendous help but we just don't uh, make use of them sometimes we complain oh i have no help no one helps me uh, like that that's utterly false if we open our eyes we see tremendous help is there lot of treasures spiritual treasures are there and that those treasures are ours we have inherited them but afterwards somehow we shut them up somewhere and then don't uh, make use of them and we forget that we have and then we go everywhere for uh, some succor some help and some instruction everywhere like beggars we travel everywhere but they say it is not necessary it's all there so that inheritance we should make use of <clears throat> and all these teachers leave behind something some treasure for us to uh, make use of to make our life perfect they leave behind some some message some inspiration and then uh, uh, some kind of guidance all this le- they leave behind only we should know how to make use of them that is where our problem lies and <coughs> when we come to swami ji you know he got all his inheritance from sri ramakrishna of course he added like in any family you know in some families they they inherit something afterwards they add in some families there's just squander so in this case swami ji added a lot what uh, he got from sri ramakrishna you know during last days uh, one day uh, he touches uh, swami ji narendra nath and then afterwards he says see i have become a fakir i have given away everything to you with this help you can do lot of work you will do lot of work for the good of humanity so he gave that what exactly he gave <coughs> in what form we don't know we say after all it's all spiritual inspiration and spiritual strength and spiritual message in what other way he gave i don't think there is any mention of that anywhere anyway he got that then another important uh, inheritance excuse me <coughs> was this in sri ramakrishna's life we find this uh, burning desire for god that enthusiasm and burning desire for god that yearning for god consciousness later on when swami vivekananda the narendra nath and others came to him some of the brother disciples of narendra nath saw in swami ji the narendra nath the burning desire in one place he says i will i will fast unto death to realize god that is that spirit and sri ram when sri ram krishna heard this he says what passed through this you don't know when compared to this what is happening in narendra is nothing is ins- insignificant so in sri ram krishna that uh, intense desire for god and then that swami ji imbibed and other disciples would see swami ji like that and they used to get discouraged oh he is like that then who are we we are nothing hmm? uh, in in uh, in front of him we are nothing hmm? such such tremendous desire for god realization and that is the thing one of the legacies of swami ji is that that intense intensity call it let me put it in very general terms the intensity of life 
intensity of spiritual life that we are we call such teachers as inspired teachers you know inspired teachers inspired in <coughs> in uh, quotation marks inspired teachers they are all inspired and inspiration comes it is not the the product of their thought it is inspiration it is the product of their first hand realization and when it came out from swami ji in swami ji as you know whatever he he did was full of power hmm? full of power he himself would say i can speak fire hmm? i am not a writer but when i speak i speak fire that fearlessness strength and that intensity of that in fact if we say legacy what have we what have we in- inherited and what we often fail to use is this spiritual inspiration lot of inspiration in our spiritual life ordinary life the problem is there's no motivation it is all lukewarm there's no fire in that at that time we should go to swami ji what we have inherited and what we have not used and then we can make use of that fire and the inspiration there are many many fiery people hmm? have you not heard many many fiery speeches everywhere some of these fanatics are very fiery the politicians are fiery all the, is it all inspiration there is inspiration and inspiration i'll read to you a few sentences from swami ji himself what is inspiration <coughs> instinct inspiration and reason are the only instruments of knowledge instinct belongs to animals reason to man and inspiration to god men it is reason that develops into inspiration and therefore inspiration does not contradict reason but fulfills it things that reason cannot get at are brought to light by inspiration and they do not contradict reason <coughs> swami ji was a prophet of reason buddhi reason and uh, uh, so everywhere he wants to they do not contradict reason the old man does not contradict the child but fulfills the child therefore you must always bear in mind that the great <laughs> danger lies in mistaking the lower for lower form instrument to be the higher <coughs> Many times instinct is presented before the world as inspiration. And then come all the spurious claims for the gift of prophecy. A fool or a semi lunatic thinks that the confusion going on in his brain is inspiration. And he wants man to follow him. The most contradictory irrational nonsense that has been preached in this world is simply the instinctive jargon of confused lunatic brains trying to pass for the language of inspiration so that is the difference he makes inspiration is above reason it is not irrational it is more than reason more than rational it should not contradict reason that kind of inspiration and uh, in uh, rabindranath tagore uh, you are all familiar with him the poet laureate from bengal he said in sir in swami vivekananda everything is positive mm-hmm. if you want to know vivekan india indian thought vedanta study vivekananda mm-hmm. in him everything is positive so there is no place for negativity in swami ji or any kind of 
uh, these uh, spurious things. <coughs> and his uh, teachings, his life teachings are all based on, as students of Swamiji know, on his realization of Advaita, of that oneness, one without a second. <coughs> and that gave him, along with his master's teaching, see, there were great uh, Advaita teachers before also, like uh, the great Shankaracharya, that is long, long back, uh, eighth century or so. Afterwards, in later days, so many misunderstandings and uh, misconceptions had crept in. So in Swamiji, after Swamiji had this experience of one without a second, when he had to interpret that, interpret that to our to ordinary people like us, Agnanis, there the language changes. Shankaracharya had one language appropriate to that age. And Swamiji had another language. And that language was greatly influenced by his master, Sri Ramakrishna. What is that? It is on the basis of that experience, a unified vision. We can't discuss enough this subject. What we have inherited from these great ones, Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, this unified vision. Unified vision, what do I mean by unified vision? It is this, trying to remain in a particular vantage point from which you can see all things in their proper places. You have a place, you have a place, you have a place, you have a place, all these have places. Not that I'm confused because I see all oneness, one, one everywhere, I'm not confused. You know, sometimes the peculiar interpretation of oneness is given, that it's all one. That means that person, uh, that person is not able to distinguish anything. It's all, you're all same, you're all one. Hmm? I sometimes call that a ma like a mashed potato. Put them all together, mash them all. That meaning of uh, Advaita is given. But in life, it's not like that. It's all one. At the same time, such a person can place everyone in its proper places like that. This is your place, this is your place. In the mind, everyone ha is there. So it's all placed in a very nice way and handled in a very nice way. <coughs> that vision is given to us. Something like a, a conductor in an orchestra. There are so many musicians, violinists are there, and the, the trumpet or this or that, and he is there going on like that. He is under the control of the whole thing. That is more or less a unified vision, especially when it comes to religion, let us say. Say different types of religions are there, different schools of thought, even in Vedanta, there are different schools of thought. And then other religions are there. And different methods of spiritual disciplines, like different yogas, they are all there. How to place them? How to handle them properly? <coughs> How to have a unified vision? Swamiji gives that. We have inherited that. I can, you can see, in, uh, we are all, in, in our own humble way, practicing some of these things. 
our universal religions or harmony of religions all those things especially those who have come in the orbit of uh, sri ramakrishna and swami ji uh, have some idea of it to some extent they are practicing even that is far far uh, above when compared to those who have not come under this unified vision many times i feel it is swami ji's sri ramakrishna's great contribution and we all have inherited and then we should be able to share with others and then so that everyone can have at least to some extent intellectually even that is all right even in intellectually feeling that you have a place christians have a place certainly muslims have a place in religion they are doing the right thing islam is a true religion and then buddhism is a true religion if they are sincere they will also reach the same goal just as hindus are so many denominations of hindus are like that all these are the how to handle without getting confused often we may become like hodgepodge you know hodgepodge that is what we call eclecticism eclecticism whenever i think eclecticism someone said it is something like a cocktail party or something like that a little bit of this little bit of this little bit of that of course i have some uh, when uh, <coughs> charles darwin propagated some of his theories some young men uh, went to a forest and then took out three or four or five small insects and cut them hmm, and put them all together one's uh, abdomen another feelers another legs another head like they put them all glued them together and came to charles darwin sir can you identify this bug and he looked at this he saw through the whole thing and then he asked uh, you see when you caught it uh, was it humming and they nudged each other and then said yes yes it was humming then it is humbug <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so sometimes when we bring this eclecticism and uh, putting the best of everything i want to put and then practice of course uh, some other teacher gave a a much better example not humbug example he says it like a bouquet of flowers you know bouquet of flowers you bring different flowers and then put it and then there is no there is no sustaining source of a, a source of uh, life energy for them <coughs> they are all there but they are all they are all disconnected from the source so very soon it, it will wilt so there must be we must be rooted in the real source rooted in the real source and then have all this uh, universalism that works because we are getting sustenance from from the real source afterwards certainly we can view them the same the same source is providing sustenance to everything one god our same source is providing sustenance swami vivekananda sri ramakrishna's harmony was that <coughs> it is from one source we are getting getting whether it is islam or uh, hinduism or sikhism or christianity anywhere try to go deep try to go deep and get that sustenance eat the fruit you know that uh, sri ramakrishna is teaching eat the fruit why do you want to uh, always count leaves eat the fruit so just eating the fruit 
then afterwards you can be very very <coughs> you are getting your sustenance then you will see others also the same source is sustaining a, a sufi mystic or a, a christian mystic or saint francis of assisi anyone what is the source it is the same source sustaining everyone try to find out that that is the inheritance that kind of a vision it is the same source in that way trying to see the harmony hmm? trying to see the harmony or universalism there is a difference between universalism of that type and the other very um, superficial type of uh, universalism i want to be good i want to good to you i want to be good to you and then i want to uh, appreciate you that's all it's more social type otherwise i may Mm, uh, i may hurt your feelings you may be offended that is why i say oh yours also is good your also is good mm. like a, it becomes a social affair not rooted in spirituality so what is this unified vision of swam vivekananda it is rooted in spirituality rooted in that oneness of experience that advaita that's why he speaks so much about advaita experience that oneness 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 are not even oneness this non dual it is there one without a second and one without a second is not uh, something like there is 1 2 3 4 5 6 and there is one other one without a second is not another category there is one uh, fine uh, story i like that so i'll share with you with bham sri ramakrishna's tales and parables there was a dyer one who dyes clothes a dyer in a small village and he used to keep uh, a tub of dye in the center of the village and people would go with their cloth to be dyed someone would come say i want this to be dyed green so he would take and dip it in this liquid and give here is your green and another would come say what color do you want i want red take that cloth dip it in the same liquid and give it here is your red another wanted blue dip it in the same liquid it is blue so whatever color they wanted it says here it is and someone was watching all this he said he came and with his cloth you see you dye my cloth of the color of your liquid there then he smiled <laughs> that liquid is a mysterious liquid it has no color of any sort but it can produce all types of millions of colors it can produce when we say advaita vedanta advaita we say somehow we make it as though it is colorless waterless and tasteless and then all less less negative but there is a positive side to it from that everything has come it is that mysterious liquid from that everything has come when you can catch hold of that mysterious liquid you have got everything that is the that answers every question it is ancient upanishadic idea what is it by knowing which i know everything that is the question asked in the mundaka upanishad what is that by knowing which i know everything it is this i, I, I if i know that that mysterious liquid somehow come into contact with that all everything will become Uh, known to us all the secret of everything swami ji's uh, teachings are based on this on this uh, highest spiritual realization it is spiritual he may be speaking sometimes you know swami ji was interested in every affair of this world <laughs> every area of knowledge every area of society every country he was interested in everything 
That's why he's a world teacher. And he has something to give. Something to that inherit, everyone can inherit from him. And this unified vision based on his Advaita realization. So when he said different religions, they're all true. Based on this. They all lead to the same goal based on this realization. And how about different philosophies? Some philosophy says, in the end, you become one with Brahman. Others will say, no, no, no. You will be there in the presence of God. That's all. Our dualists, all the time, you are in the presence of God. And you are very, very happy because you are in the presence of God. Just as a child is happy in the presence of its mother or father, you are in the presence of that infinite God. So you are always happy, you will be there. That is the end. And some others said, you feel that you are a part of God. And Swamiji wants us to see from this Advaita point of view. Yeah, they are all right. You don't have to worry that you won't prove that they are wrong and all that. No, no. That's also an experience. That's also an experience of God. And there are infinite number of experiences. And this unified vision, you can see all of them. Don't say something is superior, something is inferior. It is all one without second. And then there, there are so many facets of that. This is also one facet. They go so far as to say, even what we call Advaita in the ordinary, what we understand, that is also one of the facets of truth. That's all. Then we think that Advaitins, we are Advaitins, we want to somehow feel a little superior. We think, oh, this is superior because it's all-inclusive. What you call all-inclusive in the highest experience, that's also one of the aspects, that's all. That's also one of the aspects. That is why truth, they say, Dvaita Advaita Vivarjita. It is bereft of what we call Dvaita, what we call Advaita, it is more than all of this. That vision is given to us. It is for especially now when uh, everywhere misunderstandings, fundamentalism, this and that, all is going on. This is a very refreshing message. Refreshing message coming from the heart. Often with all our mm, with all respect for the good intentions of so many of these ecumenical uh, conferences and all that, it's all there, we admire them. But often that spirit is lacking, that unified religion is lacking there. Mm. It's something more a formal affair, a formal affair. But what Swami Vivekananda tells us is, it's not a formal affair. I believe it. I feel it. It is there. I may not be able to fully practice it because of my weaknesses, but I fully believe it. That you, they're all equally all right. Heart of hearts, I believe, a Muslim going to the mosque, if he's sincere, he's as good a devotee as a Vedantin or a Christian or anyone. He's like that heart of heart feeling that. That kind of uh, unified vision. And next is about these yogas, you know. How often we hear about these yogas. Jnana yoga. Jnana yoga is the quickest. Hmm? Quickest. Whereas bhakti yoga, though it is easy, it is slow. I don't know who measured all these things. <laughs> it's the quickest. It is the, our karma yoga is only for restless people. All sorts of ideas are there in, uh, in our religious literature, Vedanta literature, in Vedanta history, we find all these things. Someone putting one yoga in the highest place, Jnana yoga is the highest, at the most, this bhakti is a help and karma yoga is a help 
that's all. And there are some others, devotees, Bhakti Yoga is the main. It's Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga is a, just their helpers, that's all. Allowed to stay on. That kind of condescension and concession, that kind of spirit, Swamiji removed that, you know. In spiritual practices, they're all helpful. Not only that, that unified vision, they can all be nicely combined. You can't, you need not say one is superior, one is inferior, or uh, like that. These are all uh, uh, superficial views. It can all be combined. That is why, you know, in our monogram, that, uh, mm, that snake and swan, and all in all our books we have that, he made that. That is the, uh, that uh, swan is the individual soul, and there is the sun, that is Jnana Yoga, and there is the lotus, Bhakti Yoga, and there, is the, there are waves in the ocean, that is Karma Yoga, and that's awakened Kundalini, is this uh, um, uh, Raja Yoga. Through all these means, this uh, Atman is realized. So all put together, that kind of integration. How did it come again? It is on the basis of his realization. So this harmony of philosophies, harmony of uh, religions, and then harmony of yogas. All this, putting all together, that type of vision, you know. When once our vision is like that, you will be able to see everything like that. There may be some other things in different societies, let us say. Hmm? American society, Indian society, European society, like that. A person of this caliber can see the unity behind. That's what Swamiji did. When he came to the United States, see, he came from an old orthodox society, uh, India, India of uh, last century. He could easily feel at home, at home with all our American friends here, and American ways of thinking, American way of different uh, uh, practices, all that. At the same time, he knew what is what. First, like a boy, he said, ha, ah, how nice, how nice, how nice, how nice. Very soon he found out all the uh, negative part or the uh, negative side of American life, he found out, and then he had remedies for all. It is uh, the ignorance that has brought this. Awaken, wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up to your real nature, whether you are uh, in uh, America or in England or in India, wake up to your real nature. That gave him his unified vision. He says, I am not here to preach this ism or that ism. I will just tell people their real nature is divine. That's all I am telling. Everyone. Wherever he goes, that is the fact. Wherever we go, that is the fact. And he just mentions that. I, wa I want to tell everyone that I my, and my brother are one. And then realize you are true nature, Sabhava. It's an ancient Vedanta. There's nothing new really. But at the same time, it was new. In what way it is new? He removed all the encrustations. He removed superstitions, <laughs> wrong understandings, and put it to us. And then you know another legacy of Swamiji, which we should always be grateful is this, he put everything in the English language. Mm. Before him, we don't find anyone putting, it's not the translation. <coughs> Translations were there, Max Muller translation, this translation. Translation is one thing. <coughs> Taking all the essence on the basis of his own experience and putting, putting it in a simple English language. After all, some of us, younger generation monks, I consider myself a younger generation when compared to older generation. <laughs> we studied all Vedanta in English first. 
to, to Swamiji. And then afterwards, he went on referring to the Upanishad, that the Gita and all that, that is going on still now. This is already what Swamiji gave, it is their real food, we have got it. Now, this is bonus, that's all. Bonus compared to what uh, in Sanskrit, what did they say? Then we see what a beautiful light Swamiji has thrown on all these ancient teachings. After all these years and years and years, we find that is the best, not commentary, the best, best presentation of Vedanta. It's not a commentary and it's not a translation. It is Vedanta such in the English language. And it is, uh, it is for us to make use of this English language that too many of the lectures were given in London, in England and the United States uh, representing United, special, uh, United States specially representing the modern age. India is the ancient country, United States is the modern country and putting them together. Right? Putting them together without compromising anything. Hmm? Recognizing the greatness of both. Greatness of modernity and the greatness of ancient wisdom. It is not whatever is ancient, hey, go, throw it in the waste paper basket. No, Swami is not the one who did that. Did that. Or whatever is uh, uh, modern, go on glorifying it. Or doing the other way. Whatever is modern, what do they know? Hmm. Modern people, some of the senior or senior citizens say, what do they know? Even in this country, so what do they know, these youngsters, what do they know? Mm. Especially they may know a computer and all that. When it comes to life situations, they don't know anything. But Swamiji recognized both. He was very, very young in spirit. Of course, he passed away when he was 39, you know. Young in spirit and very, very ancient in wisdom. He put them all together. And he gave that in the English language. What more do you want? Hmm? What more do you want? And then he gave it in such a way, it's very palatable. Using all reasoning and then uh, satisfying human emotions, feeling side, all that he gives. And when you read, you are inspired. Oh, we must do something. Hmm? One uh, minister of religion was commenting on the, uh, the sermons. There are two types of sermons. One sermon is, after hearing that sermon, people will say, oh, how nice. He spoke very nicely. That's one type. Another type is this, oh, we should... Go and do something. Mm -hmm. That is motivating one to action. But Swamiji's lectures are like that. You should do something about it. After reading Swamiji, no one can sit idle. In some way or the other, he stirred up. He or she is stirred up. In some way. Sometimes you may, some people may fight him. Anyway, he has been, his purpose is served. He, he made them think. And then he made, he stirred them up. That is Swamiji. And this kind of, uh, this contribution to humanity is really, uh, uh, I mean, people will feel this for a long time to come, what he has done. You know that book has come, The Gift Unopened. <laughs> that means people don't know yet. A gift has been given, but we have not yet opened it. A big gift has come, the Christmas gift, we have not opened. We see what is that gift? Oh, it was given in, uh, in 1985. It's already 1993, we have not opened. Actually, he gave the gift in 1893. Now, 1993, have you opened it? Many times we feel we have not yet opened it, even after 100 years. So, this gift of giving this ancient 
ancient message and reinforced with his own experience, revalidated. Mm. That's what they say in uh, some of the scriptures. Such Shastri Kurvanti Shastrani. They revalidate it. Mm. You know, sometimes uh, uh, some of these fixed deposits or something like that, they expire. And if you go there, they put a stamp and then say three more days or five more days or one more year, it is valid. Like that, he put a stamp on that. What was considered old and this and that, they were all putting together and they put it like that. It is modern. They call it Neo Vedanta. It is modern. So everywhere you see a modern touch to it so that uh, we may not feel strange to it. When we read the uh, Swamiji's works, we don't feel we are strangers to this. Probably when we read some of the old books, whether in the Bible or in the Upanishads, hey, what's all this? So obscure sometimes, and some of the examples given are nowhere available now. Uh, things have changed. Some old bullock cart or this. Uh, if you say a bullock cart here, what can you make out of a bullock cart? Many have not seen even a bullock here. Someone said, he's a young man. He said, for a long time I did not know uh, beef came from a cow. I thought it came from Safeway, that's all. <laughs> so, it's all, but Swamiji's teaching is we don't feel strange there to me. It's very, very modern, and then modern outlook, modern language, and that is his genius. His genius, putting that. Even after 100 years, we find it's very much applicable to all of us here or in India or anywhere it is applicable. So, when we say legacy, it is this real legacy is that Vedanta, the ancient message of Vedanta given to us in the English language with that stamp, stamp of modernity, stamp of authority. Hmm? Jesus spoke like an authority, not like the scribe. It is like this authority. That's why Swamiji's words sometimes are very powerful because he spoke like an authority based on his own experience. He said, see, I fought my master for six long years. I know every inch of the way. With so much of confidence and based on his experience, he said, <coughs> And one more point I'll make and then stop. The legacy of this, the respect for man, respect for human beings, he raised the dignity, hmm. especially amongst religious people, you know how it had happened. In one place they call it, uh, oh, you're a sinner, sinner, sinner. And then uh, if you go to India and in the world, uh, oh, you're bad karma, your, your karma is like that. What can you do about it? You go on, uh, uh, suffer, suffer, or do this. All the negative ideas about this. Karma, maya, sin, all types of things. All, they all come under the same category as regards their uh, depressing, <laughs> uh, depressing values. But Swamiji said, no, man is divine. So he talked about humanism. But humanism, what kind of humanism? The ordinary humanism has a problem as practice as understood as talked about in our universities and uh, uh, social circles all the humanism is there i used to go to one uh, university uh, there they used to have amongst religion along with religions humanism also one subject hinduism judaism christianity and islam buddhism and humanism like that so they made it a religion but ordinary humanism what happens uh, their uh, problem is 
what they call burnout. Hmm? Burnout. B one uh, uh, person gave a talk in one of the medical conferences. To, she, she said, it's a burnt out syndrome. Hmm? You burn out, especially those people who work with other people, like nurses, doctors, school teachers, ministers of religion, all directly they have to work with people. They have this problem, they burn out. So what happens, this, uh, if they don't take uh, sufficient precaution, they burn out. That is our ordinary humanism. But what Swamiji said was, call it spiritual humanism or Vedantic humanism. No, when you go to a person, don't go as a person. He is the Atma. He is a spiritual being. And how about you? You are also a spiritual being. Don't forget it. Or to put it in a devotional language, you are also a child of God. Others are also children of God. So in terms of God, you deal with them. In terms of the spirit, you deal with them. So you raise the dignity of yourself and dignity of everyone. This is another contribution he made. If it's all there, nothing new, as I said. It's in the Upanishad, Gita, everything is there. But he gave it a gave it power and then the modern language he gave it to that and the ancient languages in the Bhagavatam one of the important uh, texts of Vedanta Arha Yed Dana Mana Bhyam Maitriya Abhinna Chakshusha you know how to deal with people you have to worship them mm -hmm. You have to respect them, everyone. Dana mana bhyam. One is by giving. Hmm. Should be gone giving and giving and giving. Mana, you should respect them. Maitriya, be friendly and have an eye of non difference. Like that, you treat everyone. So he raised the status of human beings, how to look upon them. There should let there be no negativity about yourself or about others. You know the psychological uh, fact, whatever attitude you have towards yourself, you will have the same thing towards others. Mm. If you are not friendly to others, that shows you are not friendly to yourself. So we go from inside out. So, everywhere it is this, this uh, mm, idea of seeing God in man, God in man, God in everything, he said, there is a lecture by him, Swamiji, God in everything. Thereby, you spiritualize all your activities. It is not the social service you do. It is not the humanitarian service you do. It is all worship of God. It's all worship of God you are doing. So this kind of vision, and in this way, sukarmi kurvanti karmani, whatever actions you considered at one time, it's mundane. It's a worldly act. We spiritual seekers should have some other type. No. If you have this spirit of seeing God in everyone, God in everything, every act becomes holy. Whether you work in the hospital, or whether you work in the school, or whether you work in a monastery, or in a church, or uh, you are a janitor, or anywhere, any honest work is worship of God. And your own taking care of children, or husband, or wife, it's all sacred. Because it's all seeing divine in everyone, and then it is not just an act, or act of goodness, or act of some social thing, it's not that, it is your spiritual practice. Mm. So, 
of course, there is plenty to talk about. You know, you have a wealth of literature as far as Swamiji is concerned. So anyway, I have tried to remember and remind you of some of these important factors in Swamiji's life. Thank you. We are very grateful to Swami to share, which he shared this evening about Swamiji. <coughs> I want to add a few more things which struck me. You see, Sri Ramakrishna said about Vivekananda, to me Nararupi Narayan, you are a man incarnation of man. There are two sages in the Bhagavatam. We read Naro and Narayana, God and man. They always come together. Krishna and Arjuna, they always come together. So Sri Ramakrishna bowed down to Vivekananda, knowing him very well that he was an incarnation of that man, that ancient sage. Hence his name also, Narendra. Nara means man, Indra means king. You are the king among human beings. That is his pre monastic name, Narendra. Some of the things we study about Swamiji are so inspiring. When Sister Christine came to India, one of our Swamis, who just died a few years ago. I interviewed him in Rameshwaram in 1986. He told <coughs> me about his reminiscences. Christine Green Steidel, she was a school teacher in Detroit. We Swami became Swamiji's disciple. So this Swami, Swami Sarvajyananda, asked him that you Americans, how do you understand Vedanta? You'll have to learn Upanishad, Gita, Brahma Sutra. You'll have to learn logic, how Shankara refutes the other schools of thoughts. You need a lot of background before you study Vedanta. How, you, I mean, how do you American people, how can you understand Vedanta? Then Christian said, You fool, you do not know who taught us Vedanta. It was Swamiji who lifted our minds to the higher plane of consciousness and taught these great teachings of Vedanta. We don't need to learn your logic and Naya and Vaisheshika and all this hodgepodge business. It is Swamiji who gave us this Vedanta. Sometimes, you know, it is very confusing. Swami was trying to tell us the main facets of Swamiji. It, sometimes it is very difficult to, to understand him. Once some young men came from Calcutta and said to Vivekananda, we like your message very much. You said God is nearer to football than Gita. We like that message. The Gita, reading Upanishad, these are all superstitions. Swamiji said, what do you mean? I read Gita every day. I love the message of Gita. So these boys are confused, they left. Then another group of people came and said, we like you very much, you don't like this Hindu superstitions, the drinking water one becomes, get purified, going, dying in Benaras one gets liberation, all these Hindu superstitions you don't like, which for the reason we like you very much. Swamiji said, who told you all these things? I drink Ganges water every day. <laughs> so those boys again got confused, they left. Now Swami Shuddhananda, Swamiji's disciple, he said to Swamiji, I am really confused, I am your disciple. Why once you said these things to these people, these, these people, this, uh, something different to other people, they are confused, they left. I am also confused. Swamiji smiled and said to him, you ask me, I shall speak to you that what you are supposed to do. Tell me, how can I get the knowledge? 
Guru Shiva, you Sadhvi. That is enough. So same person is speaking different things to different people. Once an editor came to interview him and said, what is the duty of human beings? Do you know what was his answer? The duty of a human being is not to do anything. He was confused. You give all the series of lectures of Karma Yoga, you started the Ramakrishna Martin mission to do work, and you were uh, forcing, you know, you brought this message of work, and you say the duty of a human being is not to do anything. Well, I told you the truth. The duty of a human being is not to do anything. Try. Try. You will fail. Atman is actionless. Brahman is actionless, beyond Maya. No action works there. That Swamiji said, that is your duty, to become one with Atman. At that time, you are beyond the three gunas. No activity is possible there. Extremely difficult to become actionless. You know, sometimes we study Swamiji's complete work, Swamiji's life. Sometimes it is very confusing. At the same time, he has spoken the truth and truth alone. In San Francisco, before, his, before leaving this country in 1900, <coughs> Swamiji said to a lady, Madam, most probably I shall have to be born again. You see, Sri Ramakrishna says he is nitto mukto, ever free soul. They come time to time to do good to humanity. They have no desire to, to be born. So that lady said, why Swamiji, why do you want to be born again? Madam, I fell in love in human beings. I love human beings. For the reason I think I shall have to be born again. You know, Swami's subject was so wonderful. That Swamiji's legacy to humanity. Swamiji, it was in, I think, May 1897, he wrote a letter from Almora. May I be born again and again and suffer thousands of miseries so that I can serve God in human beings. My God is the poor. My God is the wicked. My God is the sick. My God is the sufferer. This way, he really. showed a new path to all of us, how to serve God in human beings. Service to man is service to God. <coughs> Anyhow, so we are very grateful to Swami that he could come here. Thank you, everybody. Good night.